How you doing? Okay. Good. Um, where were you born, Diane? I was born in Fresno, California, mm -hmm. in the Valley. I'm mm -hmm. a Valley girl. Yeah. And uh, came over here, grew up over there, mm -hmm. came over here to go to college. Oh, you did? At um, Cal Poly. Mm -hmm. And that was in 73, yeah. 1973. Mm -hmm. Been here since. And Wayne, how about you? I was born in a uh, little town of Franklin, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up getting uh, drafted, but I joined the Air Force, went in the Air Force first. And so I ended up out here at Vandenberg. Oh, That's yeah. how I ended up in this area. Oh, I see. And then uh, got out of the service, went to Cal Poly, and uh, then got out of Cal Poly and didn't want to go to a big city to work, so I started uh, diving. Diving for? Started out, actually started diving for sea urchins first, mm -hmm. and uh, out of Avila, and then uh, I went, uh, started uh, picking some abalone, and then uh, I actually took the boat down that had then at the time down to, to Channel Islands. And dove out there for a couple of years. And what then, year would that have been when you started abalone? Uh, sea started diving uh, in '74. I graduated from Cal Poly in '74, so that summer started uh, diving uh, for urchins. And then I think it's probably about a year later I got my abalone permit and dove some abalone for which is you know it's pretty abalone fishery is pretty much over with then. Yeah, around here it was. Right, yeah. right, yeah, around here. So how did you get interested in fishing, from the Air Force to fishing? Uh, I'd, I'd always sport dove, and so I liked being around the water, dealing with boats, and so just natural to uh, start diving commercially. And I thought, man, this is pretty, this diving for urchins would be just right down my line, you know? So I started, that's how I got into it. I used to, we used to do competition spear fishing while I was going to Cal Poly, go up and down the coast, different, like up off Fort Bragg and uh, Van Dam and places like that. So just enjoyed the water, being around the water. So that's uh, that's how I got in. Then I dove, uh, what, when I got through diving, why we built this boat. Actually, I started uh, salmon fishing with the other boat. And then I did a little bit of albacore with it, but it was a small boat and I could only go out when it was really flat. So I said, man, I've got to have something I can go albacore fishing with. Mm -hmm. So that's that's when we built this boat. So your, your first boat, you did urchins and abalone off of that boat, uh -huh. and then salmon and albacore too? Uh-huh. So what size boat was that? It was a 35-foot. It was an old military plywood boat called the Mary well, Jane. I named it the Mary Jane. It was a Michael one when I bought it. Mm -hmm. actually bought it right down here at the fuel dock. And uh, that was in 74. And uh, then... Uh, Actually, I, I did uh, have a, a job, uh, leased uh, the boat out, ran divers in, uh, out of, when they were doing the environmental studies for uh, Diablo Canyon. I, I worked out there for, uh, I think, like nine months or something like that. Hmm. So, did, did you work on the uh, project where they replaced abalone? They took them from the inside and moved them out? No. Uh, I worked for uh, a company that they they had these different transects around and they were actually going and counting the number of critters out there. This was before the plant started up. And uh, then uh, they wanted to monitor what was there. And then uh, once the plant started up, then they'd go back and monitor it again, see what changes there were. But no, there wasn't any transferring of, I, I remember when they, they did that for the breakwater, I think, wasn't it? Right, right. And, and how did the two of you meet? Uh, well, I moved into a, an apartment in front of where Wayne was living, and he was a chemistry major, and I was a child development major, and I was flunking chemistry, hmm. and so Wayne became my tutor, <laughs> and um, I still ended up flunking, <laughs> but I eventually did pass, so I ended up um, I kept, I kept telling her, you've got to read the material before <laughs> you can expect this. to do any good in it, you know? So, anyway, I wouldn't have made it with a, as a tutor. Uh -uh. For her, anyway. <laughs> did, did you both manage to graduate? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you mentioned earlier uh, that you built this this boat, Capricio. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? Yeah. It's from the Webster Dictionary. It's mm -hmm. uh, a musical piece that's free and fanciful. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the same lines as Calypso. And oh, that's like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. That's the way you felt at the time. Actually, <laughs> I hate to even say this, but the way we got the name is the when we built the boat, our the name guy who came to um, paint the name on the back, he said, "Okay, I'm ready to paint it. What are you going to name it?" And we looked at each other and said, "Ooh, we hadn't really even thought about it." So we got the dictionary. <laughs> We, we got to the seas before like we got frustrated <laughs> and picked something. So, anyway, we but it's like been a, Capricio, so. yeah, and we haven't found any other boat named that, so it worked out. And uh, and she didn't want she didn't want me to name the boat or us to name the boat after her. So yeah, you know, which is what a lot of guys do. They name it after their wife. My my previous boat I named after my mother, mm. but uh, anyway, but this boat she didn't want it named after her. So. Mm -hmm. Well, this looks to me like a pretty big bike to have taken off at you know, 75. And well, it's a big investment to build a boat like this. See, that's that, but we built it. We actually we went up to uh, Port Townsend. The hull was built up in Port Townsend, Washington, Skookum Marine. We started it in 78. Yeah. Okay. Actually. All right. Yeah. And, and, uh, a couple years later. uh, we went up and bought the bare hull and, and uh, then we started, we put on our coveralls and we started uh, fiberglassing and we went through a lot of drums of fiberglass and a lot of rolls of fiberglass material, you know. Got pictures of, we built fiberglass fuel tanks and water tanks and the fish hole, we did all the, put all the fish hole in. We hired one guy up there to help us put the, the actually the shell of the cabin on in the deck. And... Uh, that's about all we we hired them to help set the engine in and stuff like that. But we just basically built it ourselves, and so you know we saved a lot there. But it took. We actually got it. We started in uh, late December, and uh, we had it to where we could motor it down the coast, and we hauled it back out in Avila. We got down here I think the first of June. We hauled in it out 79. and worked on it in mm -hmm. in seventy nine, and we worked on it in Avila for. Uh, Oh, Until roughly September. three months. Until yeah. September. And then we went fishing. and did a little albacore fishing for the first, mm -hmm. that was the first uh, time. And then we hauled it back out that winter and worked on it till salmon fishing time. And then we were able to go salmon fishing that next year. And we've been fishing it ever since. Mm -hmm. But we've been slowly, we, you know, we didn't have the mast on it then, no. And we're still not finished. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> what what uh, style boat would you call this? A motor sailor. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And are there other boats similar to it in the fleet, in the Albuquerque fleet? Yeah. Matter of fact, Craig's boat over here, the preamble, is a, uh, a sister ship to it. He doesn't have his uh, front mast on yet. Uh, but... Uh, and they changed the stern on that just a little bit. His is the only one that's different. But there's probably, oh, up through Alaska, there's probably 10 or 12 of these that are motor sailors, but, you know, guys use them to fish with. There's another one here in the harbor right now, I guess, the Maverick, that was one of the first ones that was built for fishing. They originally took this hull and they built regular yachts out of them. And then uh, guys got to... Looking at the hull and it's so big, why uh, they thought, boy, it'd be a good, uh, it'd be a good boat to fish off of. It's probably yeah. very stable. What's the beam on it? It's 15 and a half, uh -huh. 15 and a half feet. Uh, Dress about eight and a half feet, mm -hmm. 8.3 feet or something like that, and uh, 53 foot overall. And we've had, we've had uh, several times. We've had 18 tons of of spray brine frozen albacore in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's generally, I generally say it's like a 17-ton boat. So. What, what is the wood uh, that, yeah, that you're primarily? It's mahogany. The, the sides of the cabin are uh, mahogany plywood. The beams up here are solid uh, mahogany. Uh, 
either the most all of it is Philippine mahogany. Some of it, we've got some Honduras mahogany, but most all of it's uh, Philippine. And you did the woodwork yourself? Actually, that's why I got married. Okay. No, not really. <laughs> uh, they, her, Diane's dad did, a, did most all yeah, the woodwork all inside here. Uh, I did a, very little of it, but he did, uh, he did it. Uh, he did he the did rails. Most of it. The, the, the reason I said that is a lot of people come after they met my father-in-law, Diane's dad, they'd say, who did you meet first, him or her? <laughs> uh, he helped us a lot. Yeah, he's, he's a fine craftsman. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. nice work. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And you're getting ready right now for salmon. Mm-hmm. And it uh, doesn't look like there's a lot of fish around this area. So where will you be going? We don't know yet. Okay. Uh, even I talked to a friend of mine this morning in uh, Monterey, and he said it's slowed down there. So, you know, we'll probably look around here for a day or two anyway. Maybe not just right here in front of Morro Bay, but maybe down like off of Arguello, uh, Point Sal, Conception. There's supposed to be quite a few fish in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just start slowly and you know because the, the sport fishermen don't cover you know they they don't generally get out in deep water or down off you know if there's fish right out here in front and the weather's been bad so they'll pretty much stay in shallow water and, and uh, they don't get out in the deeper water so we'll look around here first before we go trotting on. What's the day of fishing like for you? You want me to? Yeah, oh. what's, what's day of fishing like for well, you? for salmon fishing, it's getting up. Well, Wayne runs out from the anchorage, starts the boat, and I don't know about four thirty, five o'clock, depending on what time the you know it gets light, and how far we have to run to get to the spot. And we start fishing at you know daylight, put the lines in, and. If it's good fishing, we'll go until the sun sets, cleaning and... Now, what we're doing, I don't know if you know that we're freezing our fish on the boat, our salmon. We didn't. And so we're one of a handful of boats on the west coast that are um, freezing our, you know, the salmon. So that takes a lot more work as mm -hmm. far as cleaning goes and, and Wayne's in the fish hole glazing and... and uh, you know, putting them on the plates and all. Um, anyway, and if, if the weather gets better, I mean, if the weather gets worse and we want to go in, we'll just uh, put the lines on the boat and go into mm -hmm. anchor and have a nice dinner and go to bed early. Yeah. So why, why have you made that decision as far as marketing your fish frozen rather than fresh market? Well, because generally the price, when, when, when our season opens, when the California season opens, generally the price goes down and because there's a lot of fresh fish on the market and for the if there's a lot of fish on the market why it has to go to the freezers because the fresh market can't absorb it all especially now that uh, there's a lot of uh, farm fish around and because uh, we've lost uh, a lot of uh, markets to that uh, fish so there's not as the, the fresh market can't absorb as much so we can get a better price after the season's over by marking it frozen than we can trying to come in and sell it at the dock. Uh, it's a lot of extra work and a, another thing is we kind of got frustrated at we try we think we take good care of our fish better than most or at least that's our idea. Everybody thinks they take good care of their fish but but we got we were a little frustrated We'd put our fish up on the dock, and somebody else put theirs up on the dock, and we thought our fish was a lot better quality than somebody else's. So we got the same price. So it was another way to, you know, kind of have a little personal pride in what we deliver, because when our fish goes to the markets, why they know exactly where it came from, whereas before. It had got mixed in with a whole bunch of other people's, and they didn't know whether it came from our boat or somebody else's, you know. 
So this way, if there's a problem with it, it's our problem. It's, it comes right back to us. So we, that's why we really spend a lot of extra time taking good care of it. And freezing, you have to really take good care of your fish because you have to have all the blood out. And you have to get it down right away on the plates to freeze. Our fish hole temperature stays between minus 30 and minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus, you know. So it freezes really quick. And uh, then Diane didn't mention it, but I generally when we get ready to go out in the morning, so I've already spent maybe 20 or 30 minutes down in the fish hole, taking the previous day's fish off the plates and cleaning things up, getting it ready for the that day's fish. And then when we come in at night while she's fixing supper, I go back in the fish hole and I'll glaze the the day before's fish, which puts a coat of ice on it to preserve it. So it's a lot of when, you know, I come out of the fish hole generally at night, everybody else's lights are off, they're sleeping and we're just, you know, getting ready to have dinner or we might eat before I go down there, you know. And then when I go down in the morning, nobody's lights on, you know. So it's a lot of extra work, mm -hmm. you know, but it's rewarding. And, and do you have your own freezer facility for storage? We take it, we don't, we put it in a commercial cold storage. Mm -hmm. We find that's a lot better. Mm -hmm. So then it goes to the markets. Yeah, question. What's a plate? Plate? Yeah, describe the plates. Uh, freezing, oh, they're, well, freezing. these plates, uh, they're, uh, they're made out of aluminum and uh, the Freon passes inside of this aluminum extrusion. So uh, it's actually like a shelf. Mm -hmm. Looks just like a big shelf. And we put little thin, cook, what we call cookie sheets on there, a thin piece of uh, aluminum on top of that. And that's what we place the salmon on. And these plates, or the cookie sheets, are sitting on top of these plates. So we set that salmon on there as soon as that moist salmon touches that really cold aluminum cookie sheet, it sticks right there. So once you lay it down, you don't move it again until you're ready to take it off and store it, you know, until it's completely frozen, or else you'll take all the scales off. You leave it on the sheet? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. right. The, and the little sh cookie sheet is just a means to pop it loose and to, you, I pull those out every morning so that it gets all the you know, extra water that's dripped off the salmon and, and stuff so it doesn't get a bunch of, uh, of uh, you know, dents in the next fish that goes on there. Oh, so I'll clean smooth. those off. Yeah, right, so it's smooth. Yeah. Interesting. And once you can complete your uh, salmon season mm -hmm. uh, and you go fish albacore, um, describe that to us. Your, your, sam your uh, albacore season. Yeah, well generally we finish our salmon season when the albacore show up close close enough for us to go fishing. And so we'll come we'll come in and I'll take these plates out because they're a dry freezing system and they're slower. They're not as efficient and I'll put coils in the boat to run spray brine which is the way the majority of guys have been fishing them for years deliver fish to the canner. So anyway, we'll convert over, get extra grocers on the boat and stuff like that. And then uh, most of the time we we head up to Oregon because that's where it seemed like the fish had been the last, you know, the majority of the time in the last 20 years. So we go up to Oregon and we'll fish off of Oregon anywhere from 50 miles out to, we've been out as far as 1,500 miles. But we don't like to go out that far because we don't pack enough fish and you get end up six or seven, eight days running time and generally not much of that time is spent catching fish. So we kind of like to stay within a couple of hundred miles of the beach while we're fishing albacore. But we'll, a typical day is get up in the morning and uh, make coffee and, and then we'll Put the boat in gear, start it in a circle. If it's not too rough, we'll just kind of go in a circle to see if any fish is, you know, was hiding underneath the boat from, you know, because little bait fish, a lot of times little bait fish will collect around the boat and then the albacore will come in and feed on them. And so you start it up and throw the gear out as you start in this circle. And then if you don't get anything, 
why you start tacking off in one direction or the other to try to find some fish. So you actually use the boat to aggregate fish. Right. Sometimes it works real good. Sometimes it's it's no good, you know. But it's fishing, mm -hmm. you know. And do you generally uh, gauge your trips by uh, the amount of days at sea, or do you wait till you have a, a 17 tons to come in? Or both? Mm. Well, you, you can answer Go ahead. That. Both, yeah. Yeah, it, depending on the weather, too. You know, if the weather gets really lousy and we're close enough to the beach, then we'll go in for a day until, until the weather comes down. But if the weather's halfway reasonable and we're catching fish, Wayne likes to stick and stay. Yeah. Stick and stay and make it pay. That's the uh, whole thing. And it's true, you know, because generally... When you go in, while well, you're in for two or three days, and then you know you have to come back out and try to figure out where to go or where the fish are at, you know. So putting in the and so, but it, and it seems like it's real easy if you go in. The next time it blows, why well, you'll say, "Well, we went in last time. Let's go in again." So you end up spending a lot of time at the dock, which uh, it doesn't put any fish in the boat. Plus, it's you know tying up in different ports is. It can get expensive, you know. So we try to stay out as long as it's not dangerous, you know. So maybe you tell us the difference between, uh, say, an average day versus uh, just a really good day. Right as far as catch-wise, yeah. probably oh, maybe uh, probably an average day would be like three quarters of a ton of fish. A really good day. Some of one of our best days, we had like five tons in one day. Uh, generally, that doesn't happen too often. A good, a really good day, generally, say two to three tons, which is, you know, it doesn't. You get those days maybe a couple of times during the season. Uh, there's quite a few times when you get a, a ton or a ton and a half a day. Last year was the best albacore year as far as catching we've ever seen, that we've we've ever had, you know. So there was a lot of days that we had, you know, two to two and a half tons a day. Uh, one day we had probably four tons. So uh, if we can make a trip, get, get our boat full in uh, all two and a half weeks, while well, we feel pretty fortunate. Our, our fastest has been 10 days. Yeah, we filled it in 10 days, you know. A lot of times you'll get a, a big day and then a, you know, say a three or four ton day and then all of a sudden, you know, towards it, you just get about the boat about full and then it'll slow down to where you're getting uh, four or 500 pounds a day, you know, so. Yeah, our longest has been 34 days. Yeah. Uh, that's when we had to travel out to the 1,500 miles. Spot. Yeah, see, so. A lot of travel time. Yeah. Yeah. But there just wasn't any fish along the coast then. So you're trolling for fish. Mm -hmm. So the boat's moving. Um, mm -hmm. Which one of you operates the boat while the other one's going in fish? Do you operate that way? Or you. Generally, <laughs> generally I run the boat. I mean, but a lot of times I'm not, you know, I'll come in and I'll get it back on the, on, the fish or try to get it back on the fish and then we'll both be in the stern pulling fish uh, but uh, generally I kind of that part of it I'm the captain uh, and uh, uh, but a lot of a lot of it is spent from running the boat in the stern we've got controls in oh, the yeah, stern controls. Oh, right yeah. uh -huh, uh -huh. but we like to uh, try to uh, we like to stay on the fish and so with you know today's electronics and plotters and stuff why you can go right back up and down the same line all day long and not bury more than, you know, 50 feet. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, but there's times, you know, I'll lay down and I'll take a nap during if it's a slow day. You know, if I get groggy or tired, or, well, I'll lay down and take a nap, and Diane runs the boat just fine. She'll stay on the fish or go out and find fish, you know, and she'll go back and forth on the fish, you know. As long as it's not too busy, why well, she handles it all by herself. She doesn't put the fish down, though, generally. Yeah, that's one thing I don't do. <laughs> and since you are a motor sailor, uh, what times do you sail? Generally, when it, 
it's convenient when we're coming, traveling out to the grounds and 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 uh, coming in, uh, and we use them more for stability than anything, you know, and a backup, make sure we get back, yeah. you know. But we don't do a lot of sailing. It does extend your range, though. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. How much fuel do you carry? We've got about two thousand gallons, mm -hmm. which is enough for about forty days, you know. Uh, just strictly motoring. Mm -hmm. So if we threw the sails out, why like, we, we could get it blown up there. But I figure if we don't have our fish hole full in 40 days, we better come in or we better do something different. That's time. You know, <laughs> yeah. because it, the season's going away and, and uh, it's going to be bill paying time at the end of the year, yeah. you know. So you mentioned to me you're going to Canada next week. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about WFOA and your relationship with them, what you're doing? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, it's we're going to end up in Seattle this time. Uh, the last uh, meeting we had was in Canada itself. Uh, but I'm president of WFOA, Western Fishboat Owners Association, which is primarily we, uh, we uh, market uh, the albacore for the guys on the West Coast. Uh, we've got members in Alaska. Uh, Washington, Oregon, California, Hawaii, and New Zealand, uh, and Canada. We've got, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, of course, we've had to get more political uh, in the last uh, ten years because uh, that's just just the way things have been going. Uh, but uh, we're going to uh, have a treaty uh, meeting. Uh, we've got a U.S. Canadian treaty where it's. Uh, uh, where boats from each country are allowed to fish in the other's waters within uh, within uh, 200 miles into 12 miles, they can they have everybody has to stay outside 12 miles in the other person's uh, EEZ. But uh, anyway, uh, there's been uh, since Canadians have had uh, their salmon fishery really cut back, we've seen a real big influx uh, influx in the last couple of years, last three or four years of Canadian boats fishing in uh, in the U.S. waters. And since primarily the biggest majority of the albacore is caught in U.S. waters, why uh, it's been more of an effect on the guys here. And it really came to a head, uh, I think, uh, three years ago when the fish were concentrated in a real narrow band off of Oregon. Oceanographic conditions. Who knows why? But it it had to have been oceanographic conditions and feed condition. But it was really developed into a crowding problem, and uh, so we we're going to have this meeting to try to negotiate some type of effort reduction. And it's, of course, it will be uh, on both sides. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's what this meeting uh, this next week is going to be about. Of, about how many U.S. fishermen and how many Canadians are involved in, uh, in the fishery? Well, uh, in last, uh, the highest figures I think for Canadian boats in U.S. waters was like about 230 boats. Uh, they claim that there's roughly about uh, 400 Canadians who have the proper licenses to go tuna fishing, but some of those wouldn't go because their boat's just not suited for it. Their licensing in, uh, scheme up there is really different from ours. But in a average year in the U.S., as far as American boats, there's about uh, anywhere from uh, 800 to 1,000 boats will land some albacore. Now that might be 100 pounds. Or it might be, uh, you know, some boats land over 100 tons. But uh, uh, probably there's, as far as guys who are actually doing it, making a good living at it, or having a substantial amount of their income come from it, there's probably only maybe like 300, something like that, 350. Mm -hmm. That's a rough guess, too. You know, a lot of guys, after they get through salmon fishing, if the albacore are available, close in and the weather's good, 
they'll run out and get some. You know, it's, it supplements their income, you know. Uh, but uh, as far as guys that are really I'd, what I'd call full-fledged, uh, I'd say it's probably more like, you know, the three or four. That might even be high. There's been discussion about going to limited entry in Albuquerque. Do you think that's necessary? Ah, uh, boy. Depends on who you talk to. Uh, but, you know, it, it'll only, I think it'll only be necessary if we ever have to come up with, if the stocks, the stocks are healthy right now. But, you know, U.S. fishermen only harvest such a small percentage, less than 10% of the world Albuquerque production. And, uh, so we don't have a big influence on how the stocks, the health of the stocks. Uh, but if someday we do, and, and there's international management is coming down, uh, and also there's fishery management plan being worked on right now for uh, the West Coast. And if someday if the stocks get in trouble and need to be helped out, uh, we're really concerned that the U.S. fishermen will have to shoulder a major portion of trying to rebuild those stocks. And uh, in that case, some type of limited entry would be good, especially, uh, you know, it, if, it, if it was for the guys who were really dependent on the fishery. Uh, limited entry's got a, it's a whole, another can of worms, you know. As soon as, as soon as some type of limited entry program gets talked about, why you see the fishery just balloon way out of, the numbers balloon, you know. So everybody's trying to protect their livelihoods, you know. So get their piece of the pie. So it's, we've worked, WFOA's worked on some type of limited entry program, but we haven't come up with anything. Nothing's been put forward. Uh, and right now the, the fishery management plan for the West Coast is not even finalized, so we can't even do anything with limited entry if we wanted to until that's done. Yeah. And then it'll take a year or two after that is done to get some type of system in place, and by then the fishery will probably really have bloomed, mm -hmm. you know, the number of participants. So mm -hmm. It's hard to say. What's, what's the history of uh, WFOA? When was it founded? Three. Boy, I think it was started in 1967. Uh, and it was, it was started by a core group of guys just strictly as a marketing association uh, because they were having difficulties marketing uh, their catch. Not actually, mainly just a stable price. Uh, there's one member, long time, he was a founding member, who got three different prices for one load of fish. They changed the price on him twice while he was under the hoist. Mm -hmm. So that was that's what got guys started on forming some type of market association for Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. I and think uh, being the president was your second term? Right. Actually, actually <laughs> this is my second term, but... The first time I was president for three years, we have elections every year mm -hmm. uh, from a, a board of directors. The first uh, stint was I was president for three years, and then I, uh, there was another fellow who took it, did it, I should say, for two years, and then uh, I've been president now. This is my fourth year of being president, and it's going to be, this will be my last year. I've already informed the board that they, they was going to have to find somebody else to to ride. I think that's a real honor, though. Well, it's Pretty it little is little. it is, uh, but you know, after a while, it takes so much work. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of evenings uh, when Diane eats supper by herself because I'm on the phone, and you know, and it's a volunteer position. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. think that I get paid, but yeah. it just costs me. Yeah. You know, not only financially, but you know, missed out time doing other things, it'd be a lot more fun. A decade ago, the large-scale Asian drift net fishery was having quite an impact on albacore. Has that been resolved in your mind? Yes. Um, and, you know, there was a, 
a lot of speculation that they wasn't actually over harvesting the resource. The reason our catches came up is because they wasn't taking their piece of the pie. We actually, they were intercepting the fish before a lot of them got here. And uh, of course it was pretty hard on, you know, us seeing a lot of these fish that were, had been net marked and, you know, damaged and stuff. And we knew a lot of them didn't make it, you know, uh, because of dropouts and, and et cetera. But uh, I think the major thing, why we saw the big increase in our production was because they just wasn't out there intercepting the fish before they got to the coast. Uh, it, but, you know, it's all speculation on too. But I really think that's why we saw our landings go up so much uh, right after that. It wasn't because the stocks were being uh, damaged that much. It was the fish were just allowed to come on to the coast so we could catch them. Uh, those boats were targeting squid primarily. Right. Um, are they still operating? You know, I'm not sure. I think some of them are, you know. Just in different areas. Then, just in different the areas, program. yeah. Right. But uh -huh. uh, albacore is kind of a strange fish as far as I know. Nobody can tell the sex of the fish or where they spawn. Is that true? Far as I know, uh, right, and which is good because you know uh, we know that the spawners are they swim deeper in the water and they're more they don't school up, uh, which it makes them more. Uh, that's why the majority of the albacore are caught using long lines because they fish, you know, at deeper depths, and uh, they're actually targeting the spawner fish. The other ninety percent. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, uh, well, not totally. Jap the J J Japanese have a uh, surface fishery that uh, catches quite a bit of fish. So it's not actually the total, probably half, 50% of the fish is uh, longline caught uh, worldwide. Uh, New Zealand has a surface fishery and then South Africa has a surface fishery. Uh, but, uh, uh, Longline fish is different from the jig caught fish because it's uh, it's uh, larger fish. They catch larger fish. Uh, they uh, when they put it in a can, why it comes out like wider. It's lower in fat, uh, which makes it drier tasting. Uh, and that fat is not the harmful fat. The, the fat in our fish, which, which is higher is uh, omega-3 fat and uh, you go into you can't tell the difference in the grocery store except by looking at the amount of grams per fat per serving and uh, jig caught fish or surface caught fish will be up around five grams per serving of fat where long line fish will be one or two grams and that's the only way everything else on the label will look exactly the same so they use they just mix it in, you know. But if the housewife doesn't read the label, she doesn't know exactly which is which. And actually, like I said, that that higher fat is the good fat. You know, they've done studies that it's better for your health and it helps your memory and uh, especially your heart. And you know, so and it's tastier. Instead of putting man so much mayonnaise in to make a salad, why uh, or a sandwich, why you. You just get the higher fat, you know. It's a lot taste. It can be a little, a little darker in the can, uh, but that's not. There's nothing wrong with the fish. It's just the nature of the beast. It's a better product. Then. It, we think so. Yeah. Right. The fresh market's even better than that. You bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think all of us that grew up around here know that. You bet. And I think well, you know, market's growing. Sure. Even even the even the canners, the people in the canning industry. When they take fish home that they've canned, they try to get the jig caught fish because they refer to the other longline fish as white hockey pucks. And so, but that's what, you know, the, the East Coast market really likes. You know, they, they like that white looking big chunk of, of uh, fish that comes out of the can. I was in Trader Joe's last night and they actually have loined 
albacore that looks right. I mean, it's uh -huh. the dark meat's cut out. Really nice looking product. Uh -huh. Imported from somewhere, but I mean, at least you're getting it right. They, they don't yeah. have just the the steaks that are yeah hockey pucks right. that are uh -huh. put the dark meat in them that are right. awful. Yeah, I mean, it's so to me, it's the marketing more appropriately. Mm -hmm. And the consumer then is going to get a better tasting product. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's all beneficial. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that uh, having the Canadians get involved in the albacore fishery is uh, they, uh, they've got really high-tech uh, freezer systems on there. And uh, they're developing uh, a market for loins. And they've actually, there's actually a machine made over in Japan that actually will loin out a fish in the frozen state. But they have to have the fish real nice and round and straight or else they get a lot of extra wastage. But uh, that market for uh, blast bled that eventually turns into being uh, tuna loins is really, really growing. It's probably in the neighborhood of, oh, three or 4,000 tons right now and they expect in the next five years it'll probably double. So. So that's one good, and and there's more, and more U.S. boats converting over to uh, blast systems, to uh, take advantage of that uh, mm -hmm. that type of marketing tool. It gives another option, mm -hmm. where in, like in 1998 we set at the docks. On um, this boat set at the dock, for 57 days before we could unload our fish because there was a world oversupply of albacore, and. Uh, that naturally the canners, the consumer, the consumer's preference, the average everyday consumer, their preference is for long line fish. So that's what the canneries are going to buy. They buy, they're in business to make money and to sell product. So if the consumer says we want long line fish, that's what they're going to, that's what they're going to buy as long as they can get it. And then if they can't get it, then they'll buy service caught fish. So the two biggest uh, players, uh, Costco and Walmart, specify that they only want longline fish. So Because of the color, you think? Basi basically because of the color and uh, because the consumer complaints go up when they start using surface caught fish. But I think a big part of that is because People open up a can, and if it's a little off color, which it's not as white. I shouldn't say off color. It, it's not what they are. They opened up last week when it was long line fish. So, you know, a lot of housewives and and men too. I shouldn't just say housewives, but a lot of people are really get nervous when they open up a can of fish, and it's a little different. It looks a little different than it did the previous time, and so. They say, hey, I don't want this. So it's one of those things where we just need to educate people more and uh, uh, let them know that, hey, this American product caught by American boats is good. And it's actually better for you health-wise than the long line caught fish caught by foreign boats. Right now we're having to send, last year we spent, we sent the biggest majority of the U.S. production to Spain. Now, it's, it's kind of frustrating to think that we have to export our product to Spain and then they're importing into the United States foreign product. So, you know, it just, we're keeping the, the freight forward people happy, you know, in business. So what mechanisms are being used to educate the public? Um, well, we're, we, WFOH, started a kind of educational campaign. Uh, we've uh, notified uh, at the chain stores that, hey, our product, you know, is caught using uh, environmentally friendly methods. We just troll jigs around on the surface. We don't have, we basically have zero bycatch of any other species. Uh, if we do have in that rare occasion where we do have a bycatch, why generally we're glad to see it so we can get, have something different to eat. You know, I'm talking about like a, 
if we catch a, a, a yellow fan or a blue fan or something. But we'll go, we'll go like all year and never catch anything but albacore. So, uh, so it's really environmentally friendly. Uh, and uh, we're uh, also notifying the chain stores that, uh, hey, this is an American product and what you're asking for is a foreign product. And when the U.S. Uh, producer is having trouble selling their product because you don't want to carry it, you want to carry a foreign product in your store, it's hurting American people. And it's hurting, the, you know, uh, not only just the fishermen, but also, you know, the buying stations, the processors, the gear, the marine supply stores, the fuel deal. It's got a ripple effect all the way down. So uh, we've started off, then as the season, this season progresses, we're going to get more and more into having news releases and just letting, trying to, trying to educate the, the consumer mm -hmm. about the difference that there is in an albacore is not necessarily just an albacore. There is differences. What's your uh, your funding base? Is it primarily just uh, dues from your members? Primarily membership dues. Yeah, uh -huh. we've got right now. I think we've got all uh, between four and five hundred members. It fluctuates up and down depending on how many guys fish uh, in the fishery the year before. Uh, some guys don't fish in albacore if the if their other fisheries are doing good. If they have a bad crab season, well, they'll fish albacore. Or if the salmon season's bad, more guys will fish albacore. So it fluctuates up and down. And with this, the uh, the uh, negotiating on the salmon uh, treaty, the U.S.-Canadian Salmon Treaty, we've lost, we had like 90-something Canadian members. And I think now we're down to about 45. So it's drop down, you know. So, uh, but uh, we've been as high as a little over 500. Which, are, are the dues uh, a set amount or an assessment? Yeah, the dues are a set amount. Uh, you pay, uh, the first year you join, you pay $300 a year. And then uh, if you don't catch uh, uh, over 10 tons, in any preceding year, it's $125. If you catch over 100 tons, it's $375. Uh, so, uh, pretty pretty low price dues for all the things, the benefits the members get. Can I, can I ask, what are the other benefits um, that you've seen over time? You said the organization started in 67, so uh -huh. then the program, well, how it developed. Okay, primarily, it started out as marketing. And it, it gave us price stability and also uh, a market for our fish. Then as, uh, as it's progressed over the years, we've uh, opened new markets in uh, Spain, uh, Japan, uh, Canada. Uh, then in the political arena is where it's really gotten hectic. Uh, there's this uh, MHLC which is a multilateral, high-level conference, and it's it's an it's an international uh, group that's gotten together for the uh, regulation of the highly migratory species across their, the whole Pacific. This is North and South Pacific, uh, and we WFOA has been at every one of those uh, conferences. They I think they had seven major ones. And now they're having uh, working groups it, to try to finalize, wrap up everything. Uh, we've also been uh, real active uh, in this uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council highly migratory species uh, plan that they're developing. I don't have the document here, but there's a document this thick that uh, our manager and uh, also at for quite a while, our legal counsel was actually sitting on the advisory sub-panel. Uh, so we've been there at the table making sure, or trying to make sure that uh, this plan would be fisherman friendly. Uh, so uh, 
you know, just trying to keep, you know, fishermen working together has been been a real big thing that WFOA has been doing. Uh, we put out a newsletter, try to keep them, put out roughly probably 10 newsletters a year, trying to keep the guys informed of what's going on. Uh, we're going to be like this next week, uh, both the manager and myself and our legal counsel will be attending this uh, treaty uh, negotiations. Uh, matter of fact, WFOA was responsible for getting the treaty in the first place. Uh, because we saw there was a need for us to be able to fish in their waters and them to be able to fish in our waters. Uh, but times have changed. Uh, more and more fisheries are being cut back and so uh, we gotta, we can't exclude U.S. boats if we're allowing it wide open for another country to fish in our water. But hopefully, you know, we'll reach something that's agreeable to both sides. Probably no, neither side will be happy, but Hopefully we'll get there. Uh, but there's just a fishing game regulations. We work on fishing game regulations in, in all three states. Uh, we, uh, we've actually uh, had input uh, at uh, the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings. In, in, uh, they're based in Hawaii, but that covers the whole, some of the South Pacific. Uh, it's, our manager doesn't sit back on his, on his rear end and not do anything. No. And, and it's amazing. A lot of the members don't realize that all the things that we do do. Also, uh, WFOA, uh, real shortly after WFOA was formed, why uh, the guys got to thinking, hey, we need to start getting some scientific, scientific information on the albacore stock. And so they formed American Fishermen's Research Foundation, or ARF for short. Uh, and uh, half of the members on that board are fishermen, and half of them are cannery representatives or buyers. Uh, so, uh, and I want to say that was started back in the early 70s. And... Uh, before any of this environmental movement or trying to save the stocks was going on. And uh, we got a logbook uh, program uh, going. It's voluntary. Uh, probably some of that information is gathered, although it's not 100% coverage, but the information that's volunteered was probably more accurate than a mandatory logbook system. And so we, WFOA through ARF has been instrumental in doing that type of situation or that type of data collection before it got to be a, a vogue thing to do. So, and that money has come from assessments. That money comes from assessments, yeah. That's uh, $20 a ton uh, is paid into that. Matter of fact, this last year, uh, they uh, ARF uh, funded a project that put uh, 20 uh, archival tags on some Albacore. Matter of fact, they did it right. They tagged them right here off of uh, Port Arguello late in the season. I think it was in uh, October. And uh, what these tags do is they actually surgically implant them in the fish and put the fish back in the water. And then hopefully someday that fish will be caught. And so then they'll be able to take that tag back out and it'll record where the fish has been the depth of water it's been in, uh, I think probably the temperature, uh, but more importantly, the, the geographic lo location of where it swam. Uh, and they're planning on putting out this year, last year it was 20 tags, this year it's going to be 100. And they're hoping in the next uh, four to five years to put out 500 of these tags. Mm -hmm. So that would increase the chance of that, of one of these fish, or ten or fifteen of them being caught, because you got to catch the fish to get the information back. But that information will be so valuable on where the the migration pattern of the albacore. What are we doing on our tape? Uh, Fifty four minutes. Anything you like to add to the discussion? 
If not, I usually ask people what's the strangest thing they've ever seen <laughs> to, on the ocean. What do you think, Diane? Oh. Oh, I would... I, I don't know how... Well, it was strange to us. It was, it was strange and it was exciting. Probably the time that... Um, it was last year, last salmon season. We were fishing um, up off of Lopez and um, we were in close and whales are migrating at that point to go back up north and a lot of times we'll have porpoise come and play along our bow and uh, that's always fun to watch them but this particular day these whales one in particular came and was playing as if, as if he was a dolphin and it was, it, it was probably one of the most exciting times I can remember in the 23 years I've been fishing was seeing this whale do these stunts along our bow and come up and he'd come up on our side and then he'd roll over and he'd like look in at us. And I mean, I got, I, I was scared but excited at the same time because I, I knew we weren't going to hurt him but I was afraid he was going to hurt us and pull our poles down and um, so I got on the radio just to tell somebody what was happening just in case something did happen and uh, but it was it was exciting he came alongside for probably I don't I can't remember now I'm like about a half hour it seemed like yeah. he played he just got it seemed like he got a little more aggressive the whole time you know yeah. And he was, I mean, he was, he'd roll on this side of the boat, and then the next thing he'd pop, and he was close, like within oh, 10 yeah. feet of the boat. He was real, was real I, it was amazing. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. It was amazing he didn't come and he, that he didn't hit the bottom. I kept thinking for sure we we're going to hear a thump or, mm -hmm. you know, that he was going to bump us, but he never did. It's pretty neat. Yeah, that was exciting. Probably the most interesting thing I ever saw on the ocean was uh, an abandoned sailboat. Oh. I found an abandoned sailboat. I was albacore fishing and it was just like out here in the bay, just beautiful weather. And I was sitting there reading, the fishing was kind of slow and I look out the door and here goes a glass ball by. So I said, gee, turned around and went back and dipped it up with the net and cruising along again and I'm sitting here reading look out the door and there's another glass ball go by and I go wow this is interesting there must be a lot of glass balls because this both of them were like within 25 or 30 feet of the boat and so I get out on the roof and I'm start scanning around with binox and uh, I look what is that way over there and it looked like an island just green you know I mean it was like two or three miles away so I start motoring over towards it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was a sailboat. The mast was gone, the front sail was hanging down in the water, and uh, it was a it was a couple had been had bought this boat, come out of the Columbia River, and they had run into bad weather. It was they bought it brand new. It was a brand new boat, and they had three I think it was three kids with them. And the kids, and then they got rough weather, and they got they started getting sick. And evidently, they had they had rolled the boat over on its side, and the sail had filled with uh, water. And then when the boat came back up, why well, it snapped the mast off, and so they had to let the rest of the mast go. And uh, finally, they got picked off by the coast guard by helicopter because they said the boat was sinking. And so when I got to it, why it was high and dry. It had some damage done to it, you know. But uh, and one of the hatches was gone. But it was uh, it was just everything was just scattered about and in the inside and all. But that's probably about the. So was it recovered? Yep. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. It's it's over here in the slip right the now. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Did you t did you tow it? Or? Yep. Yep. We, was yours? It it was. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Salvage. I had salvage claims on it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Little bonus. Uh, mm -hmm. that trip. <laughs> well, 
Right. It ended up it took like three years to ever get anything done about it. So uh, I tell everybody I'd have been better off fishing. Yeah. Do we have any tape left? Two minutes or another tape? Tell, tell me about the, the duck boat you saw off Oregon. Oh, that was, uh, <laughs> we were fishing along and we were like, what, 18, 20 miles out, I guess, up off of uh, yeah, Brookings. Yeah, we were pretty close. Yeah. And uh, we're pulling fish, and I look around, and, gee, there's a big log in front of us. And I get to looking at it a little closer, and actually it ended up being a little duck boat. He was like 18, 20 miles out. And, but he was fishing albacore. He was having a good time, you know. So we just went around, and, you know, but you just never know. You just... That's what I call population control. Candidate for Darwin Award. I saw a guy two miles up. Don't you? He was tending for me. All of a sudden, I'm I'm in uh, I'm in uh, diving and I feel this tugging on me, you know. So I come up and I come back and get on the boat, and he says, "I don't know who it is, but there's somebody coming at us." And I, where? And he says, over there, on, looks like an oversized surfboard. He's coming right, paddling right at us, you know. And he's coming down the coast. And this guy was on a paddle board, and he was traveling the length of the west coast on a paddle board. And so he comes up and talks to us for just a little while and asked us, is it okay to land on the beach, you know. And we told him, well, no, that's just Vandenberg Air Force Base, you know. But he was paddling down the coast on a paddleboard. Now that's that's crazy, you know, because he was in a wetsuit. Can you imagine a wetsuit chafing off? Mm. Crazy. Hot and cold. Uh huh. Mm. I have, I have one more question, okay. maybe one. Um, you mentioned that you've uh, you changed over to freezer freezing a uh, freezing system for storm uh. and and. Uh, um, maintaining the quality of your fish. But overall, in the years you've been fishing, what are the major changes, or any, have there been other changes in the way you fish or in the gear, or navigation, I know, has changed? Can you talk a little bit about how that's made fishing different, or better, or harder, or more complicated? Or? Probably, probably the electronics has changed more than anything. Mm -hmm. It's it probably change. in the wheelhouse has changed more than yeah, than uh, anything. Simple. Cause yeah, uh, we uh, we're able to uh, know exactly where we at at any time. When I first started fishing, I had a radio about this little bit bigger than this, and get out there albacore fishing, mm -hmm. and I would have to null it out on the the radio stations in San Luis and the one down in Santa Barbara and I'd kind of draw a, a line on the chart and I was probably within mm -hmm. 20 miles of where I thought it was but you know that's the way I did it and then as you'd come in while well, they had the radio beacons on the you know actually I was going into Alvaro then and they'd have a, the radio beacon so you could actually home right in on it it was more accurate but I actually had just a, a portable radio you know, transistorized radio, and I'd just null out the station to work, and that's where the station, it was either west or east, and I knew they didn't have any, I wasn't going to get Japan, so that's, but now, at any, any time during the daytime, like, or nighttime, or any time, you, you know exactly within 10 or 15, 20 feet of where you are, uh, and of course now we've all got plotters, which actually leaves a track on the screen to where you can actually see where you've been, you know, the whole season. You, you hook it up to the computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that reads, you can read it off the Everybody's computer. gone. So it's nice. A lot of, I shouldn't say everybody, but a large majority of the fleet's gone to using computers. Uh, everybody used to use a CB radio to talk back and forth, but now everybody's got telephones and, uh, sidebands, uh, uh, satellite communications with MRSAT. Uh, a lot of people have an email with a satellite telephone on the boat. Uh, the MRSAT's pretty much uh, uh, email, but uh, uh, you have to pay 
for that, you know, I mean, you know, per character. Whereas uh, uh, people with sat phones, they pay for the sat satellite telephone, but somebody can email them from the beach and they don't have to pay. So uh, probably the probably the in, inside the wheelhouse electronics and stuff uh, has changed the, probably the most since I've been fishing since seventy four. What about safety? Well, now we have to have the um, life raft. Uh, survival suits? Survival suits. Flares. And it's mandatory by the Coast Guard now where it didn't used to be. Yeah. Um, Ever since we've had this boat, we've had so an inflatable life raft. Just we thought that was a good idea. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of the mandatory... Uh, Coast Guard uh, required stuff now that didn't used to be. Used to have your, if you had a, a bell and a whistle and a horn and a life jackets and fire extinguishers, you're just fine. Which uh, PFD is, everybody says, a person found dead, you know, because you freeze to death in a life jacket out here. So we've got survival suits now that. Uh, survive a suit and a jug of water, a person could last for a long time. Uh, yeah. E-burps. E E-burps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it just Is goes on. Is that an acronym? Emergency, yeah, it's emergency position indicating radio beacon is what it is. And it's, we have to have one that, in case the boat sinks, will float free. And as soon as it floats free, it'll start sending uh, in emergency distress to uh, to the Coast Guard by satellite. Uh, that's pro the, the problem with them is they get so many false alarms. So whereas they they used to claim, uh, oh gee, the the reaction time is just in a matter of minutes. You know, we can be go going. Well, now they wait for another pass of the satellite before they generally before they start sending. And they'll put out over the radio, uh, there's a, a beacon going off in a certain certain position. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot of malfunctions on them. So, matter of fact, ours malfunctioned one time. and You know, but uh, they call the house. And just so happened, we were, I was running the boat back up from uh, San Pedro and Diane was, had gotten home and she got a call from them, mm -hmm. and uh, everything was okay, but uh, they didn't scramble any Coast Guard cutter or airplane or anything. But it's it's uh, I think it's probably made uh, it saved lives. There's still mm -hmm. it's not necessarily saving the boats, but it's saving the saving lives, which you can replace a boat. What did you tell them when they called? Were you in touch with him so you Yes. Could... I knew that there was no problem at that point. He I had just talked to him and over the telephone. So I and I knew that there had was had been other false alarms before, so I I wasn't real concerned. But had he, you know, been farther offshore and if I hadn't spoken to him then I would have been a little nervous. It's reassuring to know that they are so accurate, you know, and that they do follow up, you know, just to, to see. So it's nice that way. That's another thing that WFOA has done over the years is uh, if there's an e-burp going off or if there's an emergency at sea, uh, we have a communications network set up with uh, most all the boats to where we can get the information out real quick and uh, help either the Coast Guard or help the person that's injured. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's another thing of having an organization of Albacore fishermen that benefits it. That benefits everybody, not just members. You know, I mean, we don't, we don't care who it is, you know, if there's a, a problem, problem at home, you know, somebody needs, you know, they had a death in the family or a birth or whatever, we try to get the information out to the guys, member or not. You know, so just kind of a service we provide to the fleet. 
can I ask Diane one more question? Because I know we promised you, <laughs> you know, I'd keep you an hour, but <laughs> you have so, so many great um, uh, experiences and ways of expressing, you know, how things work. Diane, I want to ask you about living on a boat and, um, you know, just <laughs> what, what, yeah, what does it take to make your um, daily round work okay? I mean, you're cooking and you're doing other things and you're also a deckhand and probably assisting with a lot of other things, but can you just give us an idea of the different things you have to do to be aboard this boat? Oh, boy. Well, Tell them how it is cooking a meal. Yeah, that's tricky. That when it well, when the weather's rough, I just cook real easy stuff. <laughs> um, well, I do pretty much the same things as Wayne does. I don't do any of the engine room work. I, I do a lot, you know, when we're running somewhere. Um, I'll take we take watches. Um, each one of us will, you know, take naps, and the other one will stay stay up and watch. Um, so I do my, sh you know, share of that. Uh, you know, the I do all the cooking, pretty much. Yeah, I guess I do all the cooking. And, uh, you know, I try to keep things clean, um, cleaned up. On the back deck, I, I pull the fish and clean the fish, as far as the salmon and um, albacore. We just have to throw them on the boat. We don't, there's no cleaning involved with our albacore, so that they just come on the boat. And um, Wayne does all the fish hold work. And uh, but it's not you know it's not a an easy lifestyle at all. It's it's hard. I I think it's hard. Um, some women think it's you know easier, but I I have a hard time with it because I am truly a land lover, <laughs> and so it's it's been it's hard to uh, to um, to do. A lot of my girlfriends you know I tell them about commercial fishing and and what it involves and. The, because they don't know, they think they tell me, "Oh, you know how romantic it must be, and and uh, you know what a nice suntan you must get, and you know all this and that." But it, um, it like our suntan consists of from here down and from here up, you know, is what we get for a suntan. And as far as romantic goes, it's <laughs> after work and all day. You know, from sun up to sun down and, and cleaning fish and all, you know, by the end of the day, it's, you know, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty hard. So the romantic part comes when we get into port. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, well, I like, I like our port time. <laughs> but, you know, as far as uh, cooking a meal on a boat, it's, you know, you set something down, well, the boat's going to move. It's not like setting it on a countertop, so yeah, we've got uh, little clips to hold the things on the stove. Uh, you you can't. We've got these holders for our, you know, glasses, or you know, you you can't just set something down and it stay there. Uh, and well, while you're cooking and you're trying to chop carrots or a, a salad up. You know, not only do you have to stand up, but you've got to keep the stuff on the cutting board that you're trying to cut, and uh, make sure you don't get your finger in or at the what you're trying to cut and exchanged. You know, so it's it's a lot harder. And then albacore fit well anywhere we while we're on the boat, except here in the harbor. Why the boat never stops moving? Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's like a it's like a two-year-old kid. It wants to go, go, go. And, <laughs> and uh, albacore fishing, there's a lot of, you know, because we'll drift at sea at night. And there's times you, you lay down in the bunk and you just try to stay on the bunk, much less, you know, sleep. keep from, yeah, yeah getting, getting real nice and comfy. You know, you just try to, try to get some sleep and stay on the bunk. So, but, uh, I mean, opening the, like, Fixing the meal, opening the refrigerator, and getting something out without everything else being out on the floor is. You take a roll in it all. You know, it's not one of those things. Or trying to stand up in the shower when 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 one wall wants to hit you one time and the next wall wants to hit you another. It's it's it's, it's different, you know. <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other things. You know, personal hygiene that you try to accomplish. You know, and it, it, you're on a 
a moving platform. And sometimes it's it can get pretty violent, you know. I mean, it's just, you know, you think you get the, it's not an easy motion like this. All of a sudden the wave will break against the side of the boat and it's, it's bang, you know. So it, it's totally different. It's, it's uh, not very many people, unless you've been to sea on a smaller boat, uh, you don't really know what it's like, you know, and spent some time, you know. A lot of people go out and they'll uh, spend just a little bit of time, you know, and it'll be flat calm and they'll say, hey, this is neat. But you got to be there the whole time, you know. We've had it, we've had it going down swell with, for like three days with the wind blowing 50 and 60 knots and the waves breaking over and being white water on these windows and, and rolling the rails under constantly, you know, and... Uh, we were at 800 miles at that point, yeah. so there was no way of getting in to hide yeah. from it. No, all we could do is just experience. motor down swell slowly, you know, and we slid back and forth on that front seat because the boat was really just moving all over. and. Our bottoms got sore from sliding back and forth so much, you know. It, and it just wasn't one of those things where you could rest very good. No. It's a different lifestyle. And it's, men I think are probably more brain dead. We can put, tolerate a lot more, you know, than uh, most ladies. Then why are you a fisherman with all that? You know that tough. Me? Yeah. Why are you a fisherman? Uh, I enjoy it. You know, it's hey, it's it. There's days when there's nothing like it. You know, when you have a a real good day of fishing and the weather's great. You've got nice clean air. Uh, sunrise, sunsets can be beautiful. The f people around you, you know, is really. There's really a lot of nice, nice people in the fishing industry. Uh, and when there's a problem, it's amazing who will come to your aid and help out. Uh, I mean, you know, there's times where it gets real competitive too, but uh, it, what else would I want to do? You know, I don't know. That's a good place to mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank he'll he'll be on the boat until he dies. <laughs> no talk of retirement. Uh, yeah. yeah, to what? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know my grand. I like to, everybody, every time somebody says, what about, when are you going to retire? My grandfather, who was, who was, who was a, uh, who was a, a farmer, he said, uh, the guys would come up to him and say, Mr. Moody, when are you going to retire? And he says, I don't want to retire says, those guys that are sitting on that park bench up there, they're retired. In a couple of years, you drive back by that park bench and you see how many of those guys are still there. I don't want to retire. And by golly, he didn't until he was in his 80s, you know, because he, he realized that if you don't have a reason for living, you know, why you're not going to continue living. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, Think people can do other things, you know, but he he was just he just he was happy farming. So I'll be happy fishing, you know. I think as long as the political climate doesn't change too much more, you know. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, fishermen want to have a healthy resource. We don't want it. Ninety nine percent of the fishermen don't want to take the last fish. You know, we want, because what's there going to be, I mean, we want to continue fishing. And if we catch the last one, there's not going to be anything to fish for next year, you know. And it's a valuable, it's a valuable food resource for the, for the whole country, you know. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to eat your stocks and bonds and your, your, uh, you know, all the, a lot of this paperwork that gets generated. You know, that doesn't, you know, there's basic things that people have to have. And number one is food. Food and water. Without those things, you're not, you're not going to get any place. So, uh, I think that's, you know, commercial fishermen are, are the public's uh, 
the general public's access to, to the, the marine resource. There's only a certain percentage, a real small percentage of the people that can go out and catch their own. And this resource belongs to everybody. And so we're just the vehicle. Commercial fishermen are just a vehicle for, for uh, getting that resource to the average Joe Blow on the street, you know. And it's a good, healthy resource. It should maintain uh, generations after generations of, of people and fishermen. So, uh, but it's, it gets frustrating seeing some of, some of the agendas of some of the groups, you know, they they don't want to solve a problem, they just want to create a problem so they have a job. Uh, some of them, not all of them, and probably like like any, it's probably like any uh, any group, you've got some good and the bad, you know, so. It's true. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. That, you, I think you probably summed that up better than anyone I've mm. ever heard, you know, mm. kind of talk over, you know, how, huh. where it all fits in sure. to the big picture and what how I hope we help so. each other and sure. how we take care of ourselves uh -huh. as a society, as small communities, you know, mm -hmm. you guys have a really incredible perspective on the world. <laughs> well, sometimes it, it changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it, yeah, but I mean, you know, sometimes I let my perspective go in places where it shouldn't, you know. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's part of being an adult. You yeah. Know, you get to make mistakes, and then you get to go and explore yeah. and uh -huh. figure out a different way to do what you thought you knew in the first place. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, that's pretty good. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, we'll bill you for this over and over. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you do that. You guys have to come back yeah. and send work it, on the rails. Send it to him, okay. Uh -huh. He's uh -huh. the guy who's in charge. Uh, I usually take a couple of still photos, too. What uh -huh. kind of camera you got there? Yeah, that's just a little Canon. Is that a digital thing? Yeah. Huh. Boy, that's small. Now, yeah, I've got that's, one. That's I got a one uh, Fuji. Theirs, huh? Oh. By golly. Yeah. Huh. That comes out. To, those cool. digital cameras are nice, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Uh huh. And then if you have the computer, yeah, you know, then you got the whole thing. Yeah, I, uh, I've got one, and I just got it here at Christmas time, and I've just been taking hundreds and hundreds of pictures. <laughs> the neat thing about it is, is you can, you know, edit them when you take so many, and if if it doesn't come out good, delete it and take it over again, or you know. So uh, right. that's the neat thing about it. And how many times you get a stack of pictures back like that and you only want 5% mm -hmm. yeah. of them, maybe? Oh, I know. And the cost of processing just keeps yeah. going up and up and up. Uh -huh. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 I saw, who was, somebody printed out, oh, Lee. Uh, I don't have a, a good printer. Oh, well, I've got a good printer, but not for photo quality. And it's amazing how good some of these newer printers print out the yeah. pictures. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. It can get spendy, but, you know. But that'll drop. It will yeah. drop. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because everything like that, yeah. you know, once, once it gets to a level where they're producing it, you know, mm -hmm. enough of it, then the price starts coming down. So yeah. All of us can get one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this has come down about a third in a year. Yeah. 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 That's pretty good. Yeah. Makes you, does it make you wonder Make you wonder why you bought it when you did, huh? Wish you'd. Well, well, but actually, I'm glad I bought it. When yeah, you have you can't yeah. you can't I get stuck that. with that. I'll wait yeah. till the price drops. Cause yeah. It, it, you know. You, You'll never get it. Out yeah. Yeah. Would you also get a picture of Nancy since we don't have her out here with us too much? Yeah. Doing her camera yeah. yeah. work. <laughs> that I'll, shoot, I'll shoot you while you're shooting me. Uh, that's the way to go. That, that's, that's exactly the way our marine electronics is, yeah. you know. is By the time we get it screwed up there, the price has already dropped, you know. Mm -hmm. By the time we right. screw it up and attached, you know, why? Right. Or it's outdated. Right. Well, computers. Yeah. Same thing. 
I know. I know. I, I, I bought a laptop. Um, the, my first laptop cost me $900 because they were discontinuing them. And one of my professors said, if you're going to get one, this is it. So I ran and got it, and everybody laughed at me because it had, like, almost no memory. And, I mean, it was little. But you know what? It did a lot of work for me, and mm -hmm. I loved it. And I didn't have to replace that thing for I just bought that. No, I got some more things. About a good? year ago. Mm -hmm. And that one now, this little one that there? I have, has, like, ten times the memory of my desktop. Oh, uh -huh. Garrett, it's, it's like a one gigabyte. Okay. You know, and that... Probably Mango. They've already doubled that now. Wow. You know, in six months. It's got a yeah. lot of that vitamin A and C in eight it. years. Really? Jeez. And I mean, vitamin you know, A. I don't have navigational software sure. on Maybe it. But you know what? what the you some of that navigational taste. software is not yeah. doesn't eat up that you much. Just throw that in that, that much sink. I just want oh, a little really? teeny weeny taste. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't, you doesn't take eat up that much. You know, take this with you as you travel. But and just like. See, here's a little laptop back here right. that, that I use for the MRSAT. Uh, and it's like, uh, what is that, Windows 3.1? Oh, yeah. oh, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's old, yeah, you know. Right. But it, it works yeah. just fine. But yeah. it, see, it's just mainly doing text messages. That's right. You know, yeah. It's not doing graphics. Oh, yeah, it's exactly. not doing any of that other stuff. You right, know? exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you, yeah, sometimes you look out and I don't think make we've ever uh, uh -huh. even seen this on the sure. show. Sure, but see, I we've got so when we go to see, I have three there. computers on here. I've got a regular desktop that's that's, a good one. that's runs that screen there. Now I also have a monitor in the in a stern box that's hanging back here where I can watch our plotter program back here from uh -huh. outside. From the outside, wow. see, uh -huh. and then I have my. My, of course, I have this one here for the MRSAT, and then I have my, my regular carry-on laptop that I take to download my email, and I keep a lot of stuff on that for the association, too, you know. So we're computer poor on this boat, you know. But it's, you know, there's so many things, you know, now if they come out with something different, software or whatever, why you, uh, you just have to buy the software instead of buying the hardware, mm -hmm. you know. It's funny, as, as much new electronics as we have, we still have the same radar. Well, we have a, a new radar. We have two radars. One is, well, a year, two years old, I guess. Yeah. But we still have the same radar that we, when we built the boat back in 78, 79, we still have that radar that we will use when, you know. Good time. Yeah. Actually, this new radar that we bought up here, the, the top one, it's uh, it's a lot better than the radar we had before. It uh, we used to turn our old radar on when it'd get real foggy and windy, because the other radar would lose boats in the in the sea clutter. Well, this new one doesn't, but it's got more power too. We can, it's a 64 mile radar, and we can actually hmm. see at times we can see ships out 64 miles away yeah. you know when they're when it's not real rolling and all and and uh and it's a, probably the ship is high out of the water you know right. gives a better better target which is the radar the one right the, there the new one is up on the the right hand side that first one that's the new one and the one the older one is the one down there by the computer screen yeah, it's got my ear muffs hanging over it. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a big monstrosity <laughs> thing, but it still works. It's just amazing. Yeah, that kind of has that Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep it on here as an antique. <laughs> yeah. Jules Verne. Well, where, where was I? Uh, it, on a similar, different different technology or a different field, but a similar way I went into, oh, I know, it's Mac Teacher. And I went in to do a one-on-one -on -one little session to get up on some software. And I walked in, and this gal had a little Mac 512, you know, the very first ones that they issued. And I started laughing because she had made into a lamp. Oh, oh. That's so funny. Now, my husband still has his 512 and it's sitting <laughs> on his desk and it's still plugged in. Oh, uh, really? I don't think he's turned it on probably for at least five, maybe longer. But I 
I said, oh my goodness. I said, now I can finally tell Jack there is a reason for keeping this <laughs> ah, There you go. <laughs> there so you he go. came to the next class with me, and I said, I want to show you something. Yeah. And uh -huh. I showed her, and he was just like, oh my God, how could you do that to a computer? <laughs> So that tells you how many computers we have in our house. Uh -huh. <laughs>